I don't know where to begin once again. That was impressive. There are so many, so many biggest wins of the season this season. And I don't know that I put that at the top, but hell, like there's been so many. Does this even crack the top five? It's It was such a good win, though. It was such a good win. Just given the news we got before the game, again, like the, the theme of the season has been the high to the low, back to the high. So you get the low before the game about OG. Then you find out it might not be that bad overall, but still bad, concerning, and we'll talk about it. And then they, they go out there and it doesn't matter. On the road in Golden State, let's just win the game. Let's just win the game. And that they did. So let's talk. Welcome to the podcast. I'm your host, RJ Carbone. You are listening to BD4, where there's no better way to get your Yankees and Knicks analysis. We also do MMA. Yanks every series, Knicks every game, MMA on occasion. Let's get to it. Anthony for three. Listen, man, I know that we have more food to eat. I know that there is more prey to hunt. But it's okay to sit back and appreciate what you have every now and then. And what better, again, like at these moments this year where we've gone from high to low back to high, You know, the latest example of that being the Brunson injury. And now, after that, last night, we we get the OG thing. It's those moments that really make you appreciate this team. Um, How they're just, throughout any kind of adversity, able to just fight through it and just make you not forget, but like, calm you down bring you back down to earth and, and, and be like, oh, yeah, this team is is just going to win. So it's okay to appreciate them. So, like, shout out to the Knicks. Shout out to Tom Thibodeau. Shout out to Leon Rose and the front office executives for putting this team together. Listen, you can't love... The, the one thing you can't do, you can have your criticisms with the Knicks... Tibbs, Leon, but you can't be one of those people who, after a win like this, starts spouting off again about how you love the culture and identity of this team, but then also be one of the people who want Tom Thibodeau fired after a loss. You can't do that because the exact identity, the fight, the heart, the hustle, the resilience, the grit. Where do you think that stems from? And who do you think brought that guy in here to stem and to bring that type of identity? Tom Thibodeau in the front office deserves some fucking respect is what I'm trying to say. Do you think that all these guys were what they are now? Before they got here, do you think Isaiah Hartenstein was this good when he was with the Clippers? Do you think Precious Achua was this good when he was in, in Toronto? They hated him. 
Do you remember when Mitchell Robinson was a rookie under Fisdale? He was just out there doing cardio. Do you think Deuce McBride was this good two years ago? Hell, last year? You think it's a coincidence that we've got guys like Julius Randle and Jalen Brunson go from being good players but under-the-radar players to breakout all-star players under Tom Thibodeau? Do you think that's a coincidence? Do you think it's a coincidence that the Knicks were this 17-win team before Tom Thibodeau took over, and now they're an Eastern Conference Finals threat? It's not a coincidence. So credit Tom Thibodeau. Credit the front office, too. Because this identity that they have, it's because of them bringing in Tom Thibodeau. This identity they have, this this identity is because they give Tibbs guys that they know he'll work magic with. They bring Tibbs, Tibbs guys. They bring him Josh Hart. They bring him Miles Deuce McBride in the draft. They bring him OG Anilobi, who is his new Luol Deng. They bring him Isaiah Hartenstein, who is his new Joakim Noah. And they bring all these guys in on bargain contracts, by the way. You got Mitchell Robinson making descending money. You got OG Ananobi on the team for zero first-round picks, although I do have a little bit of a theory on that later when we discuss the injury. Even as bad as the Detroit guys have been since that trade, Burks, he's expiring, and he doesn't have to play in the playoffs, and he probably won't. And Boyan, as bad as he's been, he's always going to have trade value because of his bloated salary. Deuce McBride? even with this extension that he got, which hasn't even started yet, is pennies. It's it's $3 million a year, $4 million. Like, he got Dante DiVincenzo. The Knicks got Dante DiVincenzo on a mid-level exception deal, and he's playing well above that salary. Jalen Brunson on what could very well be the best contract in the NBA right now, playing like a superstar who's making less than superstar money. Isaiah Hartenstein, shit. Like, currently, currently, he's making pennies. They get Josh Hart for a protected first-round pick in Cam Reddish. And Hart, goddamn, his fifth triple-double of the season uh, last night in his career. Listen, he maddened me last night, but the guy's awesome. Like, I know that he missed every jump shot he took. at Golden State, another defense that you can add to the list that just keeps ignoring him on on the threes on the three-point line um and he continues to be super hesitant but like he gives you everything everywhere else it's the fucking hustle the huge deflections last night he had one in transition late in the game he had one at the end of the second half the rebounding where he's just leaping out of nowhere for them He's he's done so much everywhere else. Like I think the best way to describe Josh Hart is like as again as maddening as he is at times. If Josh Hart had a jump shot, he'd be a top three player in basketball. I'm not kidding. Like that's how good he is. That's how valuable he is everywhere else on the floor. He'd be a superstar player if he had a good jump shot. And I'm saying that in the utmost complimentary way. He is the epitome of a Tibbs guy, which is why he got 48 more minutes last night. 48 minutes, didn't sit a second. But back to what I'm saying, you have to credit Tibbs and the front office for doing what they've done and what they'll continue to do. So, shout out to all of them. The game itself. The Knicks win this game against the Warriors, one ni- uh, 119-112. to 112. They get off to this 18-4 to 4 start. Very reminiscent of the way Golden State started at the Garden a few weeks ago. The Knicks started off hot. 8-0 run, 18-4. to 4. 
I heart scoring, rebounding, playmaking. He was the story of the first quarter. Deuce McBride in the first half, knocking down some threes. Reached his career high, I think, in the second quarter and three points made. The uh, Pistons guys check in. The defense kind of slips up, you see. Golden State, with Precious in the game, a couple open threes because of drop coverage, which we'll mention. But Josh Hart makes a big hustle play. That leads to a Dante three. The Knicks go up 15. At the end of the period, Josh Hart kind of swings the momentum in Golden State's favor for a little bit. He commits a bad foul, a couple of bad turnovers, and then a defensive lapse. But the Knicks were still up six at the half. And then the second half comes, and it's very competitive. It's back and forth in the third quarter for a bit, but the Knicks offense is humming, and they eventually go up 11 points to enter the fourth quarter. And in the fourth quarter, the Knicks just locked down defensively. I heart with a big block uh, around like six and a half. Deuce McBride, a big three-pointer late. Then he has a huge foul in transition. Probably the biggest play of the game was Deuce's foul on the other end. And the Knicks win 119-112 against the Warriors. Their 11th wire-to-wire victory on the season to lead the NBA. Tom Thibodeau. Brunson led with 34 points. Deuce had 29 points. Dante DiVincenzo, a quiet 18 points. Steph Curry at 27. Jackson Davis, 19. Clay Thompson, 18 points. So many areas you could go around and talk about. So many aspects of this game that I liked. I, I think if we're crediting Tibbs right now, we could stay on that topic and say shout out to him for making the lineup tweak that he did. Tibbs could have very well easily just went back to over-liable, sticking with size, and went to his three-front court lineup. He could have very well, with OG out, gone back to the usual. Heart, precious, I heart. But, how about a little bit of flexibility? How about some adjustments? Tibbs seeing that, okay, well, we are playing Golden State. They do run small. They play Draymond at five. So let's make a tweak. Let me go with a three-guard lineup, Brunson, Deuce, and Dante in the backcourt. And good God did that pay off. I mean, 119 points. That paid off. Because if he was to just go with a double big lineup again where you have Precious and Hart, that would have been the same story. You're allowing weak side help, which leaves no openings off the blitz on those Brunson pick and rolls. But instead, he goes with a three guard lineup. And now the weak side couldn't help as easily because Brunson had three shooters waiting for him. I Hart, out of the short pick and roll, is able to play make and find shooters on kickouts. So credit to Tom Thibodeau for making that adjustments. And he's flashed these lineups where he goes small. Here and there. He's done that since the break. The Philadelphia game, the first time since the break, he did that to close the game with a small ball on up where he had Deuce and Brunson out there. And he's going to it more and more when he has to. Despite his preference for size, he bites the bullet and he's like, all right, if I have to be a little more modern and adjust to this positionless small ball nature of the game, I'll do it. And he actually matched up his lineups last night to Golden State's. He This is something he never did in the past. Never. That's why I get so confused when people just go to the old narrative that Tibbs doesn't adjust. Like he's shown you that more and more. Now I wonder if this adjustment was just exclusive to this game. Like does he do this against Denver? Because Denver has a ton of size. So I would actually probably prefer he goes back to the Precious I Heart lineup, which makes the most sense matchup-wise. But maybe he doubles down and he goes just with the best lineup possible in the small ball lineup. I don't know. But it's nice to see him make that adjustment. And he explained it in the post game, and he said it's everything that we just said. It's all. It was all about spacing, shooting. 
So, credit. And the offense looked very good. This offense last night was the best it's looked all season, which is crazy because they didn't have OG Anilobi. They didn't have Julius Randle. They still produced 119 points. It's 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 a movement offense. It's a motion offense. Now the numbers may not say it this year. I'm still trying to figure that out. Like the Knicks are bottom seven in cuts and in off uh, and in scoring off screens in terms of frequency. They're bottom seven in both of those categories, which is I'm sure part of that is because they ISO a decent amount, though not as much as they used to. But last night, it certainly felt like this this offense was in motion and moving more than it's ever been. I mean, the guards are constantly cutting from the wings. Dante DiVincenzo, Deuce McBride, Jalen Brunson's made improvements off ball, Josh Hart, OG and Lobi, even when he when he does play, is an excellent cutter. He's already shown that. And who are they cutting for? They're cutting for the guy they're running offense through, Isaiah Hartenstein. Again, if OG is Tibbs' new Lou Aldang, I heart is his new Noah. The Knicks have been constantly running offense through I heart during this time where they're missing three fifths of their rotation. And that just unlocks a new level to the Knicks in the half court. It takes so much pressure off of Brunson because he's able to get downhill off the ball now. Brunson's done such a good job, a phenomenal job, playing without the basketball that no non-Knicks fan's going to tell you that because they don't watch the team to know little things like that. But his off-ball movement, his ability to find space to cut into, his relocation on the corners, if he dumps the guy, if he dumps a ball, if he dumps the ball to a guy on the post, you know, dumps it up top to iHeart and he sprints around like he has done a really good job and the Nick guards again done a really good job of of allowing Isaiah Hartenstein to maximize his skill set his passing and his screening have ha, has been maximized the pin downs DHO backdoor sets like blind pig or there were some wheel actions we saw last night with Dante coming around iHeart fake pistol We saw that a little bit last night. He's playmaking in short roll. See that every night. The cutting, rolling, and shifting into space for my heart. When he's got the ball up top, he he doesn't miss a cutter. He never misses a cutter. From the wings, under the basket, he's got the vision. And his ability to move into open space when he doesn't have the ball. Golden State, they were blitzing. Last night, they were showing high with Draymond, and iHeart was the outlet with his ability to roll, pass, and score. And multiple times, he was moving into open space and receiving the pass, and he made a play at the basket, finished, or he kicked to the corner. Right, And he was doing this at a pick-and-roll with Brunson. He was doing it at a pick-and-roll with Dante. It's, it's the things he's able to do unbelievable and you take all of that with I heart and then you add in the defense you add in the rebounding and the hustle and the scoring last night he scored a little bit it's like no shit no shit he was a plus 26 in a seven point win <laughs> so you're asking me who am I paying this summer I'm paying I heart and I'm moving Mitch and I'm starting I heart in the in the playoffs and I'm moving Mitch to the bench. Like, that's how much... It's no slight to Mitch. But I cannot believe that iHeart's the guy I want now. When Mitch went down months ago, I thought the Knicks season was was not over, but I thought it put a ceiling on it. iHeart's possibly made this team have an even bigger ceiling because of what he's able to do with this offense. And he's still been... A defensive force. You got another Jalen Brunson gem last night, by the way. Didn't score 40. Only had a pathetic 34 points. 12 for 25. He was 9 of 16 from 2. 3 of 9 from 3. He had 5 rebounds, 7 assists, and a steal. Getting buckets. 
he's crafty, but he's very skilled. He's incredible to watch off two feet. As soon as he enters the paint, he just, it's artwork. He's incredible in pick and roll. Rejecting screens. He'll pull up if you're in a drop. He'll keep his composure if you blitz. He can isolate you, obviously. And I I thought Draymond Green had some really good words this morning on his podcast talking about uh, Jalen Brunson's ability to score out of pick and roll. And I want to play that clip really, really briefly for you. It's about a minute and a half. I actually prefer to defend him more in ISO than a pick and roll. He's so crafty, man. You start adding adding a screen of a pick and roll with Jalen Brunson, and he's coming downhill, and he's got all the pivots and side steps and drawing fouls, and he uses his body great. He finishes well. Uh, Jalen Brunson is a three-level scorer. He can finish at the rim. He can finish in the mid-range. He got a floater. He got a three. He got a pull-up. Like He scores at all levels. And so me personally, I'd rather guard him one-on-one than – Guarding him in a pick and roll. Guarding him in a pick and roll is tough, almost impossible. And like you're blitzing. But the thing is with most guys, when you blitz them, they get sped up, they get off the ball. He never gets sped up. He plays at his own place. So like even if you blitz, like he's not really trying to go somewhere. He's just going to wait till the floor opens up and then he's going to make his move. And um, interestingly enough, uh, you know, it, it works every night. And he is playing at an all NBA level. Uh, it's good to see him getting his due that he's getting. Uh, I think, you know, for I played Jalen Brunson, we did in the playoffs a couple years ago with Dallas. That is a totally different player. And by the way, he was really good then. So I'm not going to act like he was a bum then and just like who he is now. He was really good then. So much so that in that playoff series, he was actually my matchup. He was their starting guard, but I matched up with him in that playoff series because he, he was that good. So he's been good. Not sure any of us thought he'd be this. Uh, it's been fun to watch. Uh, JB is one of those guys that you cheer for because he's humble. He's he, second round pick uh, as national player of the year. High praise from one of the best defensive players of all time. Uh, and Steve Kerr, one of the best coaches of all time. Same thing. Very high praise after the game. A um, couple other players gave him some high praise, except for that. Who was it? The the dude who whoever whoever it was that fouled him. I, I gotta find out his name. Was it was it TJD? I don't know if it was him. Let's see if I can find it. Somebody had some salty comments. Oh no, it was Gary Payton's kid. It, it was Gary Payton Jr. on on Jalen Brunson talking about the foul. He said, you know the league, you can't touch anybody. All you need is a little bit of contact and they're going to call it. On Jalen Brunson, who's like the one superstar or one of the few superstars in the league who does not get a whistle and he can't get one if he tried. Um, And he's still out there dropping 25, 30 a night. Anyway, um, just, yeah, like it, it speaks volumes that these guys are giving him compliments. These are champions talking about him. Um, he was he was unbelievable last night, and he's still doing it despite all the bullshit. And uh, like Draymond said, it like he'll just kill you. He'll kill you in pick and roll. And even when Golden State stopped blitzing, Brunson just pivoted and he started spamming, like hunting Steph Curry on switches, hunting Steph on switches, especially in the fourth quarter, and just taking his, taking his lunch. Um, doesn't matter how you defend him, he's going to score. Simply put. The guy is a bucket getter, and more importantly, he's a pure winner. You know, he's a pure winner. Uh, again, the Knicks have been playing with two starters. He's had one starter next to him. One starter next to him for going on two months now. And yet, they're still winning. They're still the four seed. They're still on pace for about 50 wins. And Brunson, despite losing all of that help, has somehow gotten even better during this stretch. So, pretty unbelievable if you ask me. Um, And the other side of the floor, the Knicks continue to be brilliant. Brilliant. 
112 points allowed last night. Doesn't even tell the whole story about their defense. Their communication has been excellent under Tom Thibodeau. That's something I feel like we don't talk about enough. But their communication, signaling, directing, pointing, yelling things out, help, flare, screen, the the pre-switching, it's A1. It's grade one. It's grade A. It's a reason why their defense is so crisp and sound, and while they're able to how how they're able to rotate and close out because everybody has a chemistry with each other, which develops this synergy. Um, but their defense was phenomenal last night. Deuce McBride, holy shit! Talk about the offense, but like sticking, sticking Steph off the ball. His hand was. I don't think he. I don't think he took his hand off Steph all game. All night long. I think for all 48 minutes that he was out there, literally, his hand was on Steph. He was locked into his hips. He was face guarding Steph. Attached to him off screens. Constant, elite ball denial. And he did a very nice job. Now, Steph scored 27 points, was 8 of 20, and a minus 9 in the box score. He was 4 for 13 with Deuce McBride on him. The Knicks did a very good job scheming Steph Curry. The any actions with Draymond as a screener, the Knicks ignored him and they focused on the lanes because they wanted to make sure no cutters got to open pockets. Since Draymond's a non-threat, they didn't need to focus on them. Or if any non-threats were on the weak side, the Knicks were able to help off the weak side because of it. Smart defense. I love the synergy that the guards and bigs had out there and help. Help defense, you know, multiple times last night, you had iHeart showing so Deuce could recover back into the play, right? Uh, When the bigs were high and they were high for most of the night, they would show on an action until Deuce fought over the screen. iHeart and Deuce, great synergy. Jericho and Deuce, some great synergy in that way. I thought the Knicks' backside helped to prevent the lanes from opening up or any cuts or any easy lobs. Excellent. Josh Hart a number of times providing backside help. Deuce, bogey even. The only times the Knicks were burnt defensively is when Tibbs wasn't up high with his bigs and when he had to give iHeart some rest because of the minutes limit. The other two bigs weren't great. Jericho was in the game late in the second quarter with iHeart getting some rest. It went as you expected. You know, he had some problems in pick and roll, um, and he was a minus five. Felt like a little worse. Um, But Precious Achua had a tough night, right? Another night where you saw the issues with Precious when he's at five. Um, He's undersized. He's struggled on the glass because of that. Um, And I don't know why Tibbs initially had Precious playing in a drop, In the second quarter, CP3 is a mid-range assassin. Steph Curry is the pull-up king. I I don't know what you're doing playing a drop there. Drop coverage allows them to play their games to a tee. And it also takes away Precious' best trait, which is his mobility, his ability to switch out up top when he's at five. Um, And he was bad last night. Every time he left the floor... Good things happen, and anytime he was on the floor, bad things happen. I Heart was the best of the three by far last night. Um, and again, it, it was warranted that Tibbs had to sit him at times because he is still on the limit. And credit to Tibbs for, even with that, trying to get every bit of I Heart as he could. Precious only played 18 minutes. So, I Heart played, I think, 28. So, um, I, I think... I think that's all we have. Again, I would do a longer episode. I've got things to do. Um, I guess we'll touch on the pregame news. I, OJ Anilobi, before the game, and see, this, folks, is why I always have this, like, this, this, like, let's take it easy in the back of my head because things never go as expected. But before the game, you get news. Well, let's go back to Sunday. No, uh, Friday. Or whenever it was. Was it Thursday? 
where OG and Lovi was out there playing and you could hear him visibly screaming every time he reached in or did anything with his elbow. He was screaming in pain. Right? Like short yells. They said it was just soreness. Just soreness. Um, Saturday comes his second game back and he looks awful. You could tell his mechanics in the shot were not right because the elbow was still bothering him. He had the slam dunk at the top of the game and didn't score the rest of the way. And then yesterday morning comes, you find out he's out because of injury management. And then last night comes in Woj on ESPN saying how there is definite concern regarding the OG Anilobi injury and that he's probably going to be out longer just for the not he's probably going to be out longer than just the Golden State game. And Woj, if anybody would know, it's Woj because Woj is connected with CAA. Um, he said that OG was sent home. He received an MRI. And he's going to be out for Denver, most likely. Now, the MRI was clean. That came back clean. So that's the positive here. You're hoping that he just... Maybe he came back too soon, or maybe he's just going to have to deal... Like Maybe this is just what happens. You're coming back from a surgically repaired elbow, and you're going to have flare-ups, right? Um, but it's kind of like very Yankees-like, with just like lies. You know, it's like, why return if he's not ready? Um, what does the training staff exactly do? Why does the training staff have a job? It, all these thoughts were crossing my mind as I was hearing this news. Like, why are these player players so delicate? Like, I, I is OG going to be the same if and when he does return this season? And then one question that a buddy of mine texted me and really got me thinking, did Masai Ujiri know? Because I'm pretty sure OG had some elbow issues earlier this season. Nothing serious, but he had a couple games where it might have bothered him or he sat out, I, I think. I heard it somewhere, so don't quote me on this. But besides the point, did Masai know when he made this deal? And, like, the context behind it kind of matches up with, like, yes, he might have. Because... Obviously, these two teams are on bad terms right now. They've got the whole court case. OG and Lobi last season, before the drama, was expected to cost the Knicks multiple firsts. A couple months ago, you get him for zero first-round picks. Did Masai Ujiri know what he was doing when he moved OG and Lobi. It's just a craw it's a thought that again, I it didn't cross my mind. Somebody suggested that to me and, and it's really got me thinking. Like did he move did he know he was moving quote damaged goods? You know, it, it's very interesting. And he, and I mean like it, the longer this goes on, the more we find like I if 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 this is really a big issue if it becomes a big issue and OG's not back until the playoffs or worse, it's something I'm really going to consider. And it's like, does do the Knicks, if this does become an issue, do they... I hate to say it because he's such a big part of the team, but like, does this change anything regarding paying him this summer? Do they not pay him? Do they pay him way less? I don't know. I don't want to get into all that because maybe they're just being a little cautious right now. Um, but I hope it's not big because if it's a, if it's a big deal and it's more than just let's give him another week, which are, I, I think that's best case at this point. If it's more than that, I, I think maybe the expectations start to shift. And I go back into that dark place where I didn't want to be in. Where it's like, is a four seed really an op, an op, an op, uh, Jesus, a realistic expectation? Is this team more of a of a five six seed if they lose OG in this final month? 
um, playing, God forbid, with the way the East is, how tight it is. Are they playing? To, like Orlando has the tiebreaker. Indiana has the tiebreaker. Those teams aren't too far behind. The three Knicks that you... Like, since the OG trade was made, I think everybody's three Knicks that need to be healthy are, are probably all the same three Knicks. Brunson, Julius, and OG. And now you're without two of them, and you don't know when they're going to be back. So, it's a little scary, but I'll tell you what, the guy who filled in for him last night, Induce McBride, is getting the game ball because he was that phenomenal. Bing bang! Deuce last night, 29 points, a steal. He shot 69% from the field, 67% from three, 83% at the line. He was a plus three in 47 minutes. This was a career game for him in points, in threes made with six. Um, first of all, I'm sorry for doubting you. Deuce is somebody who I've always, like, when Knicks fans advocate advocate for him to get more playing time when they did in the past, I was always quick to like defend Tibbs and like, who do you think this guy is? This guy's a back end of the rotation scrub. I probably used that term before. Uh, I'm an asshole for that. And you're seeing why the Knicks have kept him and extended him um, and moved Grimes. Like moving Grimes sucks, especially with the way these guys are playing. But like Deuce Mc Deuce McGrimes, Deuce McBride is kind of like the new Quentin Grimes. He's this 3 and D wing who plays just so hard and he puts in so much work. And guys that play on both sides of the ball like this just fit this team. He plays so well next to Jalen Brunson that Tibbs was like, all right, fuck it. I'll bite the bullet and I'll go three guards. So credit to Tom Thibodeau. And then, like, Tibbs, Tibbs, Tibbs loves him. He's a Tibbs guy. That's why he got 47 minutes last night. You know, he's Tibbs needed a defensive constant on the floor at all times last night. He needed two. And he went with Deuce and, and Hart to play the entire game. So that tells me that, like, this kid is seriously loved by his head coach, which means he's probably going to be in the playoff rotation. Uh, I think at worst, Deuce is your number eight guy. I think your eight and a half, I think Deuce is safe from being that eight and a half guy. I think he's going to be your eighth. I think the eight and a half slash nine man will be precious and bogey and it'll be situational. But I think Deuce has bought himself a role. Now, he's not going to get a ton of minutes in a playoff rotation, but he'll get minutes because of how important he's been to the team. 15-game uh, balls. 15-game balls. If you were to tell me last year I would have given him 15-game balls, I would have went nuts and be like, what are you, crazy? He's got 15-game balls, which I think ties quickly for second on the team, which is hilarious. Um, yeah, he's got 15-game balls on the season now. Speaking of game balls, let's go to our bench. Um, this is funny because, like, I don't know. The bench was so bad, I had to go process of elimination. I'm going to give it to Boyan. Uh, now he has five game balls. But, like, was he good? No. But, like, the bench literally sucked. Um, I, I guess Precious had the best numbers, but if you watch the game, Precious did not have a good game. I'm going to Boyan because he was less worse than Burks and Precious. And Jericho barely played. Like, he hit a shot in the fourth quarter. He grabbed a rebound, and he played some better defense in help. Sure. <laughs> Let's head to break, and we'll wrap this up. Uh, be right back. Hey there. Thanks for listening in so far. If you enjoy this episode, please give us a five-star rating and review on Apple Podcasts. And if you're on YouTube, don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. Thanks so much. You can follow us on social media as well. On Instagram, we're at BD4Pod and at Rob J. Carbone. On X, we're at BD4Pod and at RJCBD4. And on Facebook, we're BD4.
If you're interested in our website, just go to www.bd4blog.com. You can subscribe to our blog on there right on the front page. Just like on the podcast, we cover Yankees, Knicks, and MMA. Also on our website are the links to the different platforms for the podcast. Thanks so much. Studio 69 Productions is a podcast production agency created by Leo Rodriguez to allow content creators to market their podcast. It's an online platform that will market your podcast or any other project that you're working on. Get in touch with Leo Rodriguez from Studio 69 Productions. You can find Studio 69 Productions on Instagram at Studio69NJ. Studio 69 Productions, where dreams are heard and born. All right, folks, the Knicks make it four straight in Golden State with the win last night. Keep on going, man. They're still here. The Knicks are still here. They are now... Still two behind Cleveland because they did win last night, but they got some news on Donovan Mitchell earlier today, um, the 19th, that says Donovan Mitchell will, he's still hurt, and he's going to be reevaluated in a week. So that's a whole situation with them. Could help the Knicks, um, who are one game up on the Orlando Magic. Now, Orlando doesn't play. uh, No, they do play. They play tonight against the Hornets unfortunate for us um but the Knicks remain three up on Philly who are sixth Philly plays Phoenix tonight which is good for us um the Knicks remain three and a half up now on Indiana who play Detroit tomorrow um I think Philly plays Phoenix tomorrow if I said tonight I meant tomorrow and then they're four up four games up on Miami who play tomorrow against Cleveland so I guess you want Miami winning that game. If you're still hoping for the three seed, I guess you want Miami to win that game. Uh, Because I feel like the Knicks have a pretty good lock to where Miami won't trump them. Um, Regardless, they have to focus on what's ahead of them, and that is Denver on Thursday night. So the Knicks have an extra day off, which is probably why Tibbs play 48 for uh for got 48 from Josh and Deuce. Thursday, the Knicks will be playing in Denver. Um listen, they're already 3 and 0 on this West Coast trip. So this is a house money game to say the least for the Knicks. Denver is Denver. They are the reigning champs with the best player in basketball on their team. They've been red hot since the All-Star break. I think they had one loss up until yesterday since the break. Um but it's house money because the Knicks, after this game, go back to New York to play the Nets, and then they have Detroit, and then San Antonio and Toronto. Not in order. I don't think any of those I just listed are in order, but Brooklyn, Detroit, Toronto, and San Antonio are their next four games after Denver. So, like, that's very a very good opportunity for the Knicks to at the very least, maintain fourth place. Um, right now, they are 41-27, and 27, which is awesome. Last night, to get their 41st win. Remember when we were looking at 41 wins as like a huge mark because it meant it would secure a 500 season? We're looking at 50 now, right? The Knicks have to go 9-5 and five just to get to 50. So, very doable given the schedule they've got. Um, but I'm just, I'm proud to be a Knicks fan. Like I said, at the top of the show, this, this is fun. Four wins in a row, six out of eight, three straight out West, huge wins against very good, solid teams in Sacramento and a decent team in Golden State. I know they've had their injuries at home this year, but despite all the injuries, the Knicks are prevailing. So hopefully everything goes well with Ananobi and man, it'd be nice to get a positive Randall update. 
I'm concerned there. But this team just wins. They keep winning. So with that said, we'll head to our final break, get back, wrap it up with our trivia, and that will be that. Stay with us. Be right back in a few seconds. Thanks for listening to BD4, where there is no better way to get your Yankees and Knicks analysis. We also do MMA, Yanks every series, Knicks every game, and MMA on occasion. All right. Welcome back to the show. Let's get to our trivia to wrap this thing up. Okay, so we got a true or false for you here. True or false. The Knicks haven't had a win streak longer than two against the Warriors in over 20 years. The Knicks haven't had a win streak longer than two games against the Warriors in tw- in over 20 years. All right, so let me know the answer wherever you can reach me. One final time, true or false, the Knicks haven't had a win streak longer than two against the Warriors in over 20 years. Let me know the answer. Guys, that's it. I appreciate everybody for tuning in. We have gone about 45 minutes in this one. So I think we said everything we needed to. Uh, again, I feel like I should have gone a little deeper and dove into deeper detail of some of the X's and O's like we like to do sometimes, but I do have some things ahead of me on my schedule today, so I don't have the most time. Um, that said, I will try to get some Yankees in with the extra day off for the Knicks tomorrow. If I can get a Yankees episode in, I'll try to, but I do have some things, uh, but we'll see. That's it here for episode 647 of the podcast. I'm your host, RJ Carbone. Thanks for tuning in and listening to BD4. If you're over on YouTube, thanks for watching this latest episode, and I'll see you in the next show. This episode was brought to you by Anchor. Hey there! If you stayed the entire way through, we thank you immensely for it. We hope you enjoyed this podcast and that you come back for the next episode real soon. Don't forget to like, subscribe, comment, download these episodes, and share them with your friends as well. BD4 is a five-star podcast simply because of you, and we'd like to keep it that way. Have a wonderful day. Go Yankees, and go Knicks!